Great. You're all set. We're live now. Thank you. So, uh, John Bailey, I'm going to be your, your moderator today. We have a great panel. Just to sort of set this up a little bit, particularly the, the title uh, of the session is, is unique. And when we were all on some of the prep calls talking about this, when you think about it, education resources, what we've seen this morning, what you've, you know, you live and breathe every day, you've seen education resources moving out onto the cloud, out onto the internet. So it's almost kind of passe to even say that now, but content sort of first moved out there, but increasingly you're seeing services, new platforms, new tools, new services that used to have to be physically in a classroom, now all of a sudden out on the cloud, out on the internet that could be accessed anywhere. And that's, that's making it cheaper to afford some of these services. It's uh, enabling new models of learning. Um, but you know, one of the phrases you used to hear at the Consumer Electronics Show was this, this major trend a couple of years ago of shifting to software as a service. But in education, we're now seeing school shifting to a service where students can start accessing not just the content, but literally instruction, just like what we saw with the, the Amplify uh, demo here, literally anywhere, whether at their home, on the school bus, at a Starbucks, in a classroom. Uh, and that's sort of enabling you know, like radically new models of education, potentially new models of education. So you have the flipped classroom where students you know, take a look at the lecture uh, at home, and then they come in and use the class time to do more interactive projects, more interactive discussion. Uh, the blended classroom, hybrid classrooms, where again, you're kind of combining the best of what technology offers with the best of a traditional uh, instruction and face-to-face -face instruction. Kind of a new model there. Uh, personalized learning that can happen through online learning as well as through new tools like you just saw with Amplify and what we'll talk a little bit about too. So, you know, this is placing huge strains on education. This is a little bit about the, the challenge of the disruption that Walt was talking about this morning as well. That you know, huge challenges in terms of not just sort of the, the potential of these tools, but how do you change a school system to take advantage of that? What does a class look like? How do you restructure instructional time? What does professional development look like? Uh, what, will this shift as a service empower students to customize their education? What are the pitfalls? What are the challenges? That's what we're going to be exploring today. We have a great panel, uh, and so I, I'm going to refer you to uh, your programs to look up their bios, but we have David Sanchez, who's uh, the VP Product Manager in Partnerships for Education Elements. Uh, we have Curtis Sasaki, who's the Senior VP for Media Solutions uh, in S Center of America for Samsung, who's doing huge, uh, huge work with, with devices, which is really key, which we'll, we'll just talk about here in a minute. And then Superintendent Dwight Jones from Clark County uh, right. School District here in Nevada. Um, but you know, I think you know, David. Let's let's start with you, just because I know Ed Elements is doing a lot in terms of the dizzying array of sort of new modalities that are enabled by new devices, as well as new content, proprietary, free content. You know, but it can be overwhelming, and it's overwhelming to manage, overwhelming to harness. But you know, talk to us a little bit about kind of what are you seeing out there in schools and with platforms and with your work in terms of how can you help harness all these different choices and really sort of focus it in a way that's going to be productive for instruction for students as well as for teachers? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, what we're seeing out there is that there's an array, the choice is the big piece that gets, uh, the array of choice, especially in an early stage innovation like this, the array of choice is what requires assistance and support to kind of walk through. Um, and, and on top of that, the, the ability for schools to um, think through and adopt the change, because what's going on here is not only tools and software and, and uh, resources from the cloud, but there's process innovation going on as well. There's new technique. And it's kind of like, I mean, when I was looking at a lot of the innovations in the device world and some of the announcements from Samsung, you know, when you can have a flexible screen, how do you design a device? So there's a, a fundamental design thinking exercise that should go on in a school. And from there, you can then, with the new technologies and what's available, you can really rethink exactly how the classroom should work. And so we've been doing a lot of work in the field on how to do that and still have the in-building leadership and the teachers participate in that design thinking exercise and own the outcome and then have what ends up getting implemented sustainable and something that is engaging both for teachers and students. And so those are the, the process innovation as well as the array of Technology sure. and software choices are the big pieces. You know, and Curtis, that's a great. So it, it is a great point, and we we heard Walt talk about that this morning too. That you know, in the past, when I first started getting involved in digital learning, they talked about computer-based education because that was the only device that students had to access these tools. Now, now there's smartphones, there are tablets, the, you know, gaming consoles. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Yeah. I was just sitting next to someone who had four four phones with her, so uh, <laughs> excessive. 
Um, but, the, uh, it, it, but again, you know, and I, I think we, we always have thought about this as, a, again, just sort of computer, but there's all these new devices, and even televisions now are getting smart. I know, you know, sure. walking around the last couple of years in the floor about, you know, there's new apps, and it creates new opportunities to deliver, you know, content and education instruction there. But you know, talk to us a little bit about how the devices are exploding and kind of what that offers education. Sure. I think, obviously, um, you know, Samsung is, is very well known for making a beautiful hardware products, you know, this is our <laughs> Galaxy uh, Note 10.1. And, uh, you know, we even have smartphones now with, you know, over five inch screens that are um, extremely popular. Uh, one, one of the things that uh, caught my eye in terms of the, the last session that Joel was talking about is how do you make devices engaging for students to use? And um, we actually are doing a pilot in Mountain View, California, which is in the heart of Silicon Valley, uh, in sixth and seventh grade classrooms. and. Um, we actually worked with Khan Academy on, a, on an application uh, specific for the tablet. And one of the unique features of, of the, the product is this, uh, this S Pen. And it's not a traditional uh, just point device, but it actually is a smart pen that can detect if your palm is on and it doesn't uh, interfere with what uh, you actually write. And what we found um, in our pilot is this little uh, pen device uh, on top of even Khan Academy, allowed students to actually see their own note taking, and it made note taking uh, and even sketching a whole lot easier. And the smile on their faces were, was uh, pretty uh, compelling because they, uh, for them to actually interact with the device, it wasn't just um, you know using on a you know typing on a glass panel, but really is, it provided them for a way to really personalize how they actually uh, interacted with the content. So I think you know as a manufacturer. Uh, of hardware, we, we have to look at ways, obviously, to make the experiences of our products you know, very engaging to uh, audiences like sixth and seventh graders. Those, those are a very tough audience to uh, to please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good it's, the experience is so you know critical because I, I you know we we were um, more recently just looking at a couple of the different proposals that school districts were submitting to the federal race to the top district uh, uh, grant competition which was all about sort of personalized learning and you know a, a bunch of the proposals that that weren't selected as winners I think probably appropriately so sort of made this mistake of not thinking about experience from the design standpoint and from the user experience standpoint it was the, what they thought is you just buy a bunch of tablets you buy four or five different types of software, internet-based services, and you, you know, something magical then happens in the PowerPoint graph, and they, you know, personalized learning happens. And that's it's just not the way it works, or even if it does even remotely work, it's not a great experience for the students. So, Superintendent, how do you, I mean, you had this huge task of, it's not just sort of finding the right devices with the right software and the right sure. content, but it's mobilizing that in a way, not just making it available uh, and hoping that teachers and students use it, but you know, integrating it in, into your education reform, into sure. your instructional, sure. how, do you, how do you use these different tools and services to help drive change and accelerate the work that you're trying to do for teachers and students? Sure, John. First of all, I want to say how much I appreciate the feedback you just gave as we were a loser on Race to the Top, now I know why we <laughs> lost. So that was really helpful. Your I have not gotten great. that feedback. Um, number two, um, you know, I, I just want to connect for a moment with what Joel talked with us about. And, we, are, we have a couple pilot sites of what they demonstrated right here in the Clark County School District. We're the fifth largest school district in the country. We have 357 schools, 311,000 students. So it's a, it's a great opportunity, I think, to innovate and to try to move this dialogue forward. Uh, some of the biggest challenges certainly are, are we bringing our teachers with us and are we creating the right kind of environment to move it forward? And in some cases, I'd say we fail miserably. And in other cases, we're trying to rethink how we do that business. So let me give you a couple examples. Zoe, Joel excuse me, gave you an example of kind of higher order thinking. We'd all agree that young people are going to have to be able to do that. The Common Core says that's going to be a component, that they're going to have to measure what they know and they're able to do, and are they able to do it? Joel gave you an example of how a lady in, I think, Carolina or something was rethinking, you know, if you only have five words, you know, how you can say died and can sell a new car. Well, let me give you an example that's a real example that we're dealing with right here in the Clark County School District. We have a Rancho High School, which is a traditional high school, but also has an aviation magnet. Now, when I was a commissioner of education in the state of Colorado, Aurora, which is a suburb in the Denver metro area, also had an aviation magnet. But in that aviation magnet, the key was that students would actually get their pilot's license and learn how to fly. 
Now, that's a good thing, learning how to fly and students actually getting the math and all that goes along with actually being able to create that is a good thing. What I'm excited about of how students are pushing us along. So in the aviation magnet here, students still get their pilot license and they still fly and students are offering, you know, if you visit that school, they'll take you up if you want to see how well the students have learned. You know, let's hope you get with, you might want to progress monitor to see who got an A and who didn't because <laughs> that may be a challenge, but, but here's how they've taken it further. In the aviation magnet here, the students have created a new engine. The engine is solar powered. And the solar power engine actually allows you to fly, but equally regenerates itself as it flies. And so that won them the national award so you can see how the students have so transformed and moved beyond just our limited level of thinking about how we start to use devices and use technology to help kids get a pilot license to now we're having to work with them on saying, how do you patent your new idea? Because actually solar engines, as we look at fuel cost, may be a new way of how we one day fly. And students have generated that at Rancho High School here in Clark County in the aviation magnet. So the challenges that we have is the teachers that we have, most of them have not come through the traditional training system. They're folks that have come from industry that now have got an alternative license and are teaching. So it's a new way of thinking about how do we bring the kind of expertise into the classroom and it may not be the old model of preparation schools or where they get their license and how do you license that? The second piece is how do you create the environment at the school site with the infrastructure and the pieces and get the right tools. What my colleagues here are describing is the tools that kids have to have. So how do you create the environment to say, how do we bring those tools into the classroom and almost set the students free to have and to sometimes help us engage? So John, it's a real challenge, but I like how if we're smart enough to almost let the students take the lead, how much we can actually learn as a system. Which is key too, I think, from that design thinking standpoint that you mentioned, which is starting with the student and trying to think yeah. of what, you know, it was one of the things that I, I think Joel's presentation and, and demo helped capture too, of just what rich, engaging content or experiences would look like, and then how does that you know, drive personalization, which you know, maybe is a, good, is a good question for, for everyone on the panel, but you, you know, personalized learning, customized learning has always been sort of the holy grail of education, and, and it's, been, you know, it, it's been talked about for years. You could go back to Thomas Edison talking about how you know, the phonograph and the movie projector would help revolutionize and personalize education, and it, it's, always been, it's always been sort of one step out of reach for us in terms of reality. What, what, why has it been so difficult to reach that goal of personalizing education for students? And, and are we there yet now? Are we there now with technologies, tools, and the, the services? And maybe you can give us a perspective just because of what Ed Elements is doing, kind of what you're seeing in the field and how schools are adopting it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm, think, I'm reminding of my kids saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Yeah. You know, in the back of the car. And I think that there's definitely that question one of the things in terms of imp, you know, implementing models that work now and, and having a, a blended learning environment that is affords some personalization work is you have to have a really clear-eyed understanding of the state of the art today. I mean, I think uh, from our experience, I would say that a lot of the adaptive um, models and software are definitely getting to the point where there is a very uh, special kind of relationship between the student and the software, and there's more going on there, but not enough to say that you know, there isn't a lot around that that's required from a process standpoint, teachers to intervene, be involved, and provide data feedback. And so I, we end up doing a lot of work as we look at the evolving state of the art of the content at you know, how much does this need to be supported by the process and the teacher in the classroom versus how much can it do on its own. And depending on the type of school and part of the design thinking exercise that actually occurs at a building level is you know, what kinds of constraints are there in the school in terms of types of faculty, familiarity, comfort with certain types of adaptive products. There's all these different factors that go into designing for that particular environment. Um, and those all have to be taken into, into account. Sure. Uh, so there's not kind of a one solution or one model that's going to work for, for all schools. So how are you driving that, that towards that a system, very large system, very yeah. complex system, towards that goal of personalizing instruction? 
Uh, yeah, I, you know, when the U.S. Department of Education just put out their last Race to the Top application, they initially had put in it that every application has to have and be able to prove that you can do personalized education for all your youngsters. The secretary hosted a call where large district superintendents got on the line and said, that's gonna be a huge task for us to be able to do, and though that's a lofty goal, the money that you're offering, you could only, you know, the highest award you could get was like $20 million as a large district, to say that's about a $50 million investment just to try to personalize the individual learning for every youngster. It's a nice goal, it's a good thing to do, very difficult to envision of how you ultimately implement that, especially in a large system. One of our biggest challenges, doesn't matter what we do, even if it's to try to do a new staff development, is scale. When you think about it, in the Clark County School District, we have 18,000 teachers. Well, I don't even have a location where 18,000 teachers fit. And so if you're gonna try to say, let's bring all the teachers in, let's just train them up in one day, so I think what David is talking about with education elements, about rethinking the business about how we interact and how we kind of move this into the system, to create an individualized learning environment for each youngster. I say we have to expand that. I really need that almost individualized learning environment for each of my teachers. Because teachers still have to engage and lead this effort. So if we're not careful, we focus so much on the individual learning for the youngster and again, I go back to what I started with, we leave the teacher behind and ultimately we wonder why there's such a disconnect. And so even though the students are ahead in some cases because you know, I have a nine-year-old son at home that already purchases things online and, will, and probably bids against some of you on certain <laughs> products that he wants to get and already has a uh, card that he gets to use that his allowance and he gets to save up and put on his card so he can purchase stuff without even needing our permission. And so this is how kind of youngsters are thinking about it so much differently than maybe at least my generation and maybe yours as well. So <laughs> David and Education Elements, I think, are helping us to research and think through how we create this challenge to get to individualized learning. A blended learning model, in my opinion, is the right way to go. We really pushed online education and what we found was online didn't work for a lot of kids. But it works in conjunction with the teacher. You can't just say the teacher doesn't matter. You have to continue to say, how do we do a blended model where we blend those together? That's where we get the best result. A tremendous challenge, but I appreciate my colleague here to say, hey, we're helping you rethink that challenge about how we ultimately get that done. Yeah, it's a great point, because we in education have always made that sort of a binary thing. That it's either traditional education or online education. If you kind of think about it, there's no other sector. Every other sector, it's always been blended. You know, shopping, it's sort of a blended environment. Yeah. It's, you know, the uh, hospital healthcare system, you're gonna hear a great presentation from Lord Putnam later on today where he's gonna show that sort of contrast, but in hospital systems, not, you don't get surgery completely online. It's sort of a blended of the best of technology with the best of what doctors and nurses have to offer. It, it seems that a huge part of blended learning and personalized learning comes back to, if, if the students don't have the devices, there's not a way to access the content, the adaptive tools and, and logarithms to help personalize it. But, you know, I, I think one of the, the challenges has always been the digital divide of you had students that had access to devices and students that did not have access to devices. And what are you seeing in terms of, you know, again, sort of the, with again, the, the just explosion of new devices, but how, how is that impacting pricing? How is that impacting the digital divide sort of broadly? And what is that enabling in terms of new models for us? Right, I mean, I'll talk in the context of the pilot we're doing, because uh, we're learning a lot from, from the pilots. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the price of uh, tablets is substantially lower than laptops, uh, as well as the cost of managing it. What um, we're, we're finding, though, is, uh, to our surprise, is in our pilot, uh, we're in uh, three, sixth, and seventh grade classrooms. And our thought was that the, the tablets would be given to students to take home at night. Uh, the, the classrooms that uh, the pilot is in um, have either one computer that's shared amongst 35 kids or five computers shared, shared amongst even more students. So in that environment, the, t the teachers and the students basically could not actually interact, even with the blended learning environment at the same time. So we thought, great, you know, we'll uh, see a, a dramatic change by having a, a, the tablets per student in the class, which is happening. But students weren't able to take them home. Because the classrooms themselves, and this is in the heart of Silicon Valley, <laughs> to my surprise, um, 
they actually, the, 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 school, uh, the teachers and administrators decided to actually share the tablets amongst 300 students. So what does that mean? Um, yes, the hardware will work, but from a, you know, the, the services side, that meant uh, we had to make the tablet also be able to support multiple students per tablet. Fortunately, uh, the timing was right where um, with the Android operating system, they now support multi-user. So uh, students using a tablet can have their own uh, environment. You know, we also, in, in the pilot, uh, have, uh, in, a, in a blended learning environment, use uh, Khan Academy, which is all about individualized, personalized learning. Um, and at the same time, we're actually collecting real-time data of how the application, which we actually wrote uh, with, with Khan Academy, is being used by the kids. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's very interesting to see the, the actual usage patterns throughout the day, uh, what topics are being used, for how long, uh, are they actually watching videos, are they spending more time on the lessons mm -hmm. and assessment parts. So we're, we're getting all this data right now. It's, uh, you know, I, I think some of our assumptions weren't actually right. So you know, John, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, John, could I just add to a little bit of what Curtis is describing? I, I think he's exactly right. He talked in the pilot where they're not letting the students take it home. Here, um, we've got six. Uh, our schools are very large, so our average high school is about 2,500 to 3,000 students, and we have 48 of them. So when we're doing a pilot, it's a pretty scale issue again. It's a, it's a large investment. So we're piloting right now in our middle schools just what Curtis is describing, but we do let them take them home because we're trying to do two or three objectives at the same time. One, these are schools that are about 100% free and reduced, and in most cases, they're anywhere from 80 to 100% minority population. In most cases, it's Latino. Um, and so we're trying to say, how do we correct that digital divide here in the district? So the iPad's a pretty good way, and they can take it home. You can keep it at home, We've only had one so far show up at a pawn shop, and you know you have a device that tracks it. <laughs> so we tracked it right there and was able to pick it up. And the person that had taken it to the pawn shop said, well, I was going to get it back for Monday. I just needed a little capital over the weekend. So, <laughs> so you know, that hasn't been a big issue, but it is part of what you have to think about. But it is taking it home. It's the student having 24-7 access some of the software that is there, so we're pushing. Now, some of you have been doing algebra in eighth grade for a long time. Here, we're trying to say, you've got to get algebra one done in eighth grade if you're going to take higher order math to be post-secondary ready, so we need you done with algebra one when you go to eighth grade. Well, we have a tutorial that's on that iPad that these kids take home. I am not sure. I have forgotten so much about math. I'm not sure I could help my son with algebra. So there's a tutorial that goes step by step on the algebra problems that the teacher can go through, load the problems, and there's a tutorial in there where a person goes step by step through the problem. Look how homework has just changed for 24-7 access for youngsters being able to take it home and be able to access that. Well, how do you afford it? Title I dollars, I believe it's a better way to realign resources towards the greatest need to do just what you're describing. So I really agree with what you're describing. I really agree that you've got to be able to take it home. Kids need that 24-7 access. And you've got to change that learning environment. So we're learning a lot from that kind of an investment. Yeah, I think one of the, just to add on to that, I agree with the, the direction this whole conversation is going, which is one of the most powerful elements of the you know, blended models is a mix of modalities for learning. And so when you see students interacting with digital content to do the remembering and understanding piece, then especially in certain types of rotational models, the teacher for the you know, applying and analyzing and then you know, some kind of project or collaborative station for the actual creative elements, there are different types of devices or configurations that work for that. Mm -hmm. um, and so a variety, it doesn't mean that there has to be one-to-one -one Laptops. It could be you know a third of the class has laptops. Third of the class, mm -hmm. you know, you have a third with tablets, and and multi-user situations really facilitate the the rotation model. Mm -hmm. But that's part of what is powerful about the blended model is enabling every student and driving the kind of academic outcomes by this mixed modality yeah. for these concepts. Yeah. It struck me too. How, I mean, a theme of this whole conversation has been the it's more than just technologies. That design thinking that you mentioned. It's thinking yeah. about the instructional change, and, and I was struck by 
something you said about the, how the devices were bought by that one school that was piloting it, but they, they kept it within the school, right? The kids yes. couldn't take it. And, it, and it, you know, I, I think we see this a lot where it, it's not the technology that's holding back the innovation. It's, the, it's we're automating old ways of doing it or sort of just we're not really taking advantage of the, the, the full flexibility in some ways. I, mean, I think also uh, the other one we had was, um, you know, most of what's delivered on here is from the cloud, right? It's not locally uh, stored. And um, yeah. for a lot of the schools that uh, uh, some of the administrators we, we also interacted with, it was challenging them for, for them to figure out they have different problems. What actually cloud services would actually help them solve problems? Mm -hmm. And finding a way for them to sort of mix and match mm -hmm. depending on their needs, uh, it's very difficult. They had to go, you know, Google search and try to find, oh, I need a tool for grading. I need a different tool for, you right. know, uh, uh, lear learning assessments. So it, it was, uh, I think that's one of the things that we can do better is actually uh, take a lot of the innovation that's happening. I mean, uh, again, being in Silicon Valley, I get to talk to many startups mm -hmm. and, and, and VCs. And the VC community invest, is investing pretty heavily right now uh, with companies coming up with very targeted solutions mm -hmm. in education. But the challenge that they have is how do they get exposure? Right. And, and how do these things actually work together? Uh, but it's all happening in the cloud, which is great, because right. uh, it makes administra administering it in the classroom kind of go away. Right. Right. It gives you more access from any device right. that could connect to the cloud. Huh? Yeah, that's something that we spend a, a lot of time on, actually, in terms of a large portion of our team that's just about assessing what's out there and a lot uh, advising, getting experience with you know, some of the leading products and understanding what they can and can't do and, and advising on how to curate the right I, kind of, I call it, how do you curate the right cocktail of content and tools for a given classroom or student and teacher population? Sure. Yeah, and, and before, if you don't mind, John, yeah. just real quick, um, you know, and, and I'm not trying to offend anyone, but I will say ultimately, and some of you are in the business of the tool, so the iPad, two years from now, that's not going to be where we invest our dollars. We're working on policy changes right now to say, it's the kids that already carry their own device. So I'm not going to spend a lot of money on actually purchasing devices to send home. The kids already have the devices if it is a smartphone. So for example, but we have to change our policies because ultimately we could say you can't have your phone at school. Now we're actually saying not only can you have your phone at school, we want you to be able to access it and start to access learning that can take place 24-7 just using a tool that most of our kids already have. So one of, our, one of my administrators is here from Canyon Springs. And Canyon Springs is a pretty impoverished area. It's a school that's in turnaround that is really moving forward and, and trying to do things in a different way, which I really applaud. But what has to happen, in my opinion, at Canyon Springs is to say, even though kids may be in poverty in Canyon Springs, I would bet 90% of the kids have a phone. So if we rethink how we access using those phones, whether you're poverty or not, it's amazing how I may not be able to afford bread, but that kid still has a phone. And that phone, you better not take it away. So you see how two years from now, we're not going to be investing in iPads. We're going to be investing in saying, who has the tools that can engage with these smartphones to be able to access curriculum and pieces there? And the cloud is really going to play a big part in that. I have a question for you. Yes. In fact, is the digital divide now whether you have a smartphone or a stupid phone? <laughs> Aren't there only smartphones anymore? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just transferred at Christmas, and I'm still trying to figure my smartphone out. And I think my phone is smarter than I am. So. Mind you. Questions, questions from the you? audience. Why don't you come out to me? Hi, my name is Susan Gouch. I'm at uh, Pepperdine University in uh, Malibu, California. Um, and my question is, is uh, it could be for any of the panels, actually. Um, but one of them is, what about the secondary markets that we're talking about? So for example, um, I think it was the president of Ohio had said, you know, parents are willing to pay uh, universities a lot to turn their 18-year-olds into 21-year-olds. So that might justify the climbing wall. Um, and you guys are all talking about blended learning. And the secondary market that I see from that is every single parent who's thinking, what in the hell am I going to do with my kid who's sitting at home? 
are there secondary entities that you're working with? I, the Minerva project sounds promising in that they're setting up pods and, you know, for higher ed in different cities and so forth. Um, and then also the larger ecosystem. So if I drive around Boulder, Colorado, or Ann Arbor, Michigan, or Madison, and I think about the entire economy of that city being built on the university, um, again, the same thing is true, I think, for K-12 in some ways. What are the secondary markets that you might be working with, especially if you're talking about blended learning and the larger ecosystem? You wanna? I, I'm interested cool, about what Superintendent Jones will say on this. I mean, from my point of view, um, I think that there's a, there's a question about uh, how much t t parents, especially in the US, are willing to spend on some of that supplemental content. I think that they will, over time, probably spend more. There hasn't, from what I've seen, seemed to be a lot of appetite for that in, relative to other markets. Um, but I do think that the challenge is Having what they select and, and choose to be consistent with what's happening in the classroom. So this, this feedback loop of data that's going to be happening in these blended classrooms should also inform what, parent, what action parents take when they choose to supplement or augment. And so uh, we've been thinking about it. I, don't, I haven't seen a lot of integrated opportunities for parents to, to do things or buy things or supplement what's going on in the classroom in an informed way based on the data stream that's coming out of the classroom. But that's the world that I envision being really powerful in terms of having the whole feedback loop and the users that are consuming that feedback loop not just be the students and the teachers, but then the parents and all sorts of other, you know, there's the social emotional elements of, you know, services and support that are provided to schools can benefit from that data stream. All of those inputs should inform academic choices. All of that needs to, you know, everybody needs to be in the flow there to make good decisions that are consistent and accelerate progress in a, in a consistent direction for the student. I mean, we, it's interesting, we uh, participate in a focus group of parents who purchase uh, tablets for their, for their children. And uh, the interesting question we ask is, so what are they using it for? And what applications, sure. you know, do you allow them to purchase? And they said that's the biggest problem. They don't, actually don't know how to figure out what applications they should purchase for their kids to use. And that was kind of surprising to us. The other uh, area that uh, we started uh, discussions with is in Sacramento. Um, we began talking to uh, boys and girls clubs for after school activity. You know, could technology be used in, in boys and girls clubs? Uh, we also began uh, working with uh, Teach for America, who helps you know uh, teachers learn uh, and uh, you know how to bring technology into the classroom so that when they go there, it, it's uh, it's very easy to, for them to adapt. So I, I think um, you know we what we're trying to look at is there's a large ecosystem beyond just the schools. You know where are the, all the touch points where technology can play, where cloud services can play. And then how do you actually bring all this information together so every part of the ecosystem can say, hey, OK, I understand what's available for me uh, to help me solve some of my problems. Thank you very much for bringing all these diverse thoughts to the table. My name is Gigi Johnson from the Marimel Institute. And we help higher ed on this, but listening personal work I've done on K-12 basis, there's an issue, site council parent, voting on money, lock-in of new technologies, and yet we're talking here about um, uh, not having to buy the three to five year cycle of the you know, computers in the classroom. How do you make decisions? And I'm probably talking to more as a superintendent <laughs> having that asset here. How are you making these decisions on, are we getting lock-in making these purchase decisions, partnering with great innovators, and we're gonna get wedded to an investment versus being fluid with all these new innovations and decisions. How do you figure long-term budget thoughts based on these innovative actions? Yeah, that, that is um, probably the elephant in the room to take, how do you take scarce resources? Um, you know, Las Vegas, Nevada has been hit just like the rest of the country, but hit really hard by the downturn in the economy. And as you can imagine, that certainly flows through the schoolhouse door. 
And some of the biggest challenges I've had is to say, how do we keep investing? We've made about a $50 million investment in continuing to move technology and innovation forward because I don't think you can afford to not make that investment, but it's been a hard sell. Because when you're in position that you may be cutting teachers, you know, how do you say, well, we've got to keep moving forward on this investment and, and keep, and you know, because failure to invest actually costs you more, but it is a hard sell with the community. Those are difficult decisions to make. Part of my biggest challenge is convincing the community. When students got the iPads, that was all over the media. And then there was an investigative reporter that says, well, how can you spend this money on iPads and, and how can you do that? And, and you know, it's, it's having to go on camera and say, do you know that the plumber that comes to your home will pull up on Google and see if they have the part and maybe diagnose the problem using an iPad? Yet, where we're supposed to be innovating youngsters to get ready for the real world, you expect them not to have that as a tool? And so it is a real conversation. For us, it's about a $50 million investment over the next three years because we have to continue to move forward. We're really trying to rethink how we get the best return for that investment. Students' engagement really matters when they have the tool. Kids write more. Um, seems like when they write on the tool, because they're very used to it, they write more. I think it's the right kind of investment. Last point I would make on higher ed, I, I thought the last presentation was interesting, and I didn't ask the question. Chancellor Klein is certainly a friend. They talked about they were looking at this for higher ed, but the focus was all on K-12. The data was from 2008, and we're trying to rethink how we do this business. I will still tell you, again, not trying to have a fight with my colleagues in higher ed who are good friends, but when I drop kids, K-12 is actually starting to innovate, and it's really starting to move. I would say when I drop kids off at the schoolhouse door for higher ed, nothing's changed. And there still are these big lecture halls and, and that innovation. I've got youngsters coming back to me very frustrated that they've been in a different kind of classroom working with teachers in a blended model and they go into higher ed and they're supposed to take a step backwards. So I say that focus has got to be P20 and it's got to, be, it's got to move into 20. And, and I don't know about you, when I was commissioner, it's a difficult move to just get K-12 and higher ed to even talk. Mm -hmm. And now we're saying the classrooms are changing in K-12 and the focus is there, but we've got to really, I think, expand that and stretch that because some of our kids have to take a step back when they move into post-secondary. This has been a great discussion and conversation, and uh, thanks to all of you for the questions and for, for listening and participating. Can you join me in thanking our panel, panelists as well?